My talk today is on echocardiography and dilated cardiomyopathy, an age-old tool, but what is new? So I have no disclosures. So you may see this slide repeated several times um, throughout the day, and in fact, I, I think I've actually stolen this slide from Professor Sharma. But as many of you know, the athlete's heart is a constellation of structural, functional, and electrical changes that occur in the athlete due to long-standing athletic training. We often see chamber dilatation, not just of the left ventricle, but of all four cardiac chambers, as well as hypertrophy, particularly of the left ventricle. We see augmented stroke volume, as well as enhanced diastolic filling. And on the surface ECG, we see bradycardia and repolarization changes, as well as chamber uh, voltage criteria for chamber enlargement. The factors that sort of determine the spectrum of athlete's heart are dependent on several things. Firstly, the type of sport that the athlete undertakes. For example, an endurance uh, cyclist is going to have a very different heart to uh, an Olympic weightlifter, for example. Males tend to get more changes than females, although um, perhaps my colleague will talk a little bit more about this as we go through some of the work that we've done recently at St George's. It's not surprising that the more intensity of the training, the more likely you are to get these changes. And a lot of the work that is done, particularly with Professor Sharma on ethnicity, that we see a lot of changes, particularly in athletes of Afro-Caribbean descent. So again, for those of you familiar with the Mitchell classification of sport, uh, I apologise, but for those less familiar with this, this is a way of dividing the type of sport into the intensity and the more um, dynamic and static components that the athlete undertakes. So, for the purposes of this talk, I'll focus predominantly on those with a high dynamic component. So, fingers crossed these videos play. Yeah, great. So, just to um, let that play for a second. So, this echocardiogram is of a 31-year-old triathlete. And you can see that there's marked dilatation of all four chambers, but particularly the left ventricle. There's a marked sinus bradycardia. And you wouldn't be sort of faulted for thinking when you first look at this, that this could be a cardiomyopathic process. However, we know that this patient, this person does in fact have no pathology and this is purely ad physiological adaptation. So therein lies the issue that we have when we see physiological adaptation, but we're confused as to whether this could be an underlying dilated cardiomyopathy in those individuals with left ventricular dilatation and a borderline low ejection fraction. So a lot of the work has been done, the study by Antonio Pellicci and Barry Marin, looking at over a thousand Olympic athletes. And they found that 14% of them had left ventricular dimensions that would be in the realms of what we considered possible dilated cardiomyopathy. Further study done by Eric Aberdell in Paris, who looked at 286 Tour de France cyclists. And they found that over half of them had dilated left ventricular cavity dimensions. But more interestingly, they found 11 or 12% of them had not only left ventricular dilatation, but also had an ejection fraction that was in that sort of mildly impaired or borderline range. And of course, you wouldn't be able to compete on a 21-day grand tour if you did, in fact, have a dilated cardiomyopathy. So we know that this must be, in part, physiological adaptation. And some of the work that I believe my colleague Dr. Finna Carroll will present later is why is this all important? Well, although a rare cause of sudden cardiac death, dilated cardiomyopathy is, does affect around 2% of those young individuals who have sudden cardiac death. And if you add into the mix the individuals who may develop the post-viral um, DCM as well, you're talking about 3%. So this is a, an issue that we need to understand. And I suppose one thing to, to make the point is that many, um, in the past, what was an athlete for many uh, people would have been someone who was on the TV, who was, you know, competing at the highest level. But we all know people competing in triathlons, Ironman triathlons. Uh, even my, uh, a friend of mine has done the Marathon de Saab. So this is something we're seeing very commonly, not just in sports cardiology, but in general cardiology clinics. So how, how can you differentiate athlete's heart from dilated cardiomyopathy? Well, it goes about saying, if an athlete is coming to you without, with new symptoms, particularly ominous symptoms, such as syncope or reduction in the ability to train, then of course you're going to think this is more likely in keeping with some pathological process. What about the 12-lead ECG? 
Now, the one thing that we know is that ECG is very, it's an excellent tool in picking up other cardiomyopathic processes, for example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But some of the work that we presented at the American Heart Association last year and our experience suggests that actually a lot of people with very mild dilated cardiomyopathy have essentially a normal ECG. So this may not be as useful a tool as we initially would have thought. What about the baseline echocardiographic features? Now, some work has been done to show that athletes do have superior indices of diastolic function and also of longitudinal function. So this is the minutia of echocardiography is important when looking and assessing these athletes. What about cardiopulmonary exercise testing? Again, a very useful tool in other cardiomyopathic processes. But anecdotally, my personal experience is many patients with a dilated cardiomyopathy who have a very mild phenotype can exercise very well and can train their, their VO2. And so it's not unsurprising to see someone who does in fact have LV impairment due to a proven cardiomyopathy that has a peak oxygen consumption of more than 120% of predicted. What about cardiac MRI? In London, for example, I think we're very happy to refer nearly every patient that comes through for, for a cardiac MRI because it is important to look directly at the myocardium. But maybe for dilated cardiomyopathy, it doesn't add as much as we initially thought. You often see dilated volumes in athletes as well as sort of sometimes you can see the borderline ejection fraction. But only 20 to 5 to 30 percent of patients will actually have myocardial fibrosis or scar. So sometimes it doesn't add that much more um, than the, echo, the baseline echocardiogram does. But then this brings us on to the next aspect of the talk. What about exercise echocardiography? Can, can that be helpful? And the assessment of contractile reserve, may that be a useful parameter? And the, the data is very much lacking in this uh, to date. There was a study published by William Abernethy looking at American footballers and a sort of a side, a sort of a very small line in the end of the paper, they did assess um, stress echocardiography in the individuals with a borderline function. But the methodology was very unclear and there's very little um, data in the paper to suggest what, what was actually done to, to come to the conclusions that they made. So just to come back to the MRI uh, issue, I think now a lot of the time, not only in a research tool, but actually coming more into clinical practice, we use the use of T1 mapping, which may help. And sort of in a very simple terms, T1 mapping shows the presence of very subtle or diffuse fibrosis that may be suggestive of um, a very early cardiomyopathic process. And this study that was done in Glasgow looked at 25 um, endurance athletes and 18 patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. And they found that the native uh, T1 values uh, were lower than those in the dilated cardiomyopathy process, uh, cohort. And so maybe the use of CMR with uh, T1 mapping may be something that we can use in the future. But I think further data, the numbers were quite small, so further data would be required in this field. But I thought this was a good quote before I go into talk about the work that I did. Sometimes the question is quite difficult, but actually the answer may be a lot more simple than you think. So what we, we did is we looked at 25 patients who were asymptomatic, so in the New York Heart Association Classification 1, uh, and 40 endurance athletes. And we subjected them to ECG, uh, detailed echocardiogram, and stress echocardiogram. Now, I apologise for the pixelated uh, picture, and this, unfortunately, is my brother-in-law, um, but I managed to recruit him into my study. Um, and this is the bike that we used, which is a tilting cycle ergometer that we, we subjected the athletes to a 20-watt per minute protocol, and they exercised to maximum capacity. Now, we didn't just look at sort of baseline echo windows. We also looked at um, global longitudinal strain, diastolic parameters, both at baseline and at peak, and I'll talk about some of the results that we find in a second. So essentially, there was age-matched uh, group, predominantly male, predominantly Caucasian. Um, and you can see clearly that the athletes exercised a lot more than this, the controls, the DCM cohort, sorry. So they were all in the Mitchell classification with the highest level of endurance athletic activity, so we had predominantly cyclists and some rowers, um, and we had um, the members, 20 members of a team from a UCI um, cycle uh, club, 
as well. So I apologise for the, the busy slide, but essentially, if you look at what the slide shows, is that all but one of the DCM patients were, was in sinus rhythm, and they didn't have that many abnormal parameters on their ECG. Again, giving further evidence that maybe the ECG is less sensitive and specific in this setting. Again, I apologise for the busy slide, but I just draw your attention to some of the features that we found. So firstly, not surprisingly, the diastolic and longitudinal function was higher in the athletes than in the DCM cohort. The global longitudinal strain was also higher in the athlete, but almost at the low level, of sort of borderline uh, abnormal as well, which is, not, which is something that has been looked at in the past. And the augmentation and the improvement of diastolic function with exercise and improved longitudinal function was much more marked in the athletic cohort. So what did we find? I mean, the main aspect of this study was looking at contractile reserve and what that means in the athletic cohort. So we looked at the, in, in the patients with proven dilated cardiomyopathy. Eight of them actually deteriorated their LV function from baseline to peak. About 50 to 60% of them had a sort of modest increase in left ventricular function from about 0 to 10%. But only two of the DCM cohorts had a increase in the ejection fraction from baseline to peak of more than 10%. This is in stark contrast to the athletic population when all but one of them had an increase of more than 10%. And actually, when we calculated the symptoms in the athlete who had less than 10%, it was actually 9 So it was pretty much nearly there anyway. So I'm just going to play. This is an example of a UCI cyclist. And you can see... That at baseline, particularly on the four-chamber view, this ejection fraction looks at the borderline level. But what happens when we exercise them? I'll let that play. So you can see clearly that in both the four- and the two-chamber view, the cavity, the left ventricular cavity dimensions decrease, both in systole and diastole, and there's an improvement in the ejection fraction from around about 50% to about 70% in the at peak exercise. Now, this is in contrast. This is a patient with a very mild dilated cardiomyopathy and has a similar ejection fraction at 45 to 50%. I think the baseline Simpsons comes out at 48%. And you can see that the LV function doesn't really improve or change. So when we went on to do some statistical analysis, I'll not go into labour this too much, but the ROC curve is a way of assessing the sensitivity and specificity of a test, and we find an area under the curve of 0.96, suggesting a very high sensitivity and specificity of this test. We then went on to look at those athletes in the grey zone and compared them to the DCM patients, and we found an even higher sensitivity and specificity in this group. Now just to draw a box and whisker plot, if you see clearly there was one outlier um, and two patients that did have an increase of more than 10%, but this is the real world. We would expect uh, some patients with dilated cardiomyopathy to have contractile reserve, but all but one they had all but one of the athletes had greater than 10%. And if we use the value of 10%, then it's a very sort of simple um, number to bring into clinical practice. It's a very easy thing to implement. And we would get pick up nearly every um, person who ha actually has pathology. So just a few take-home messages. As many of the cardi cardiomyopathic processes we see, they can overlap with an athlete's heart. But differentiating the two entities in this setting can be very difficult in dilated cardiomyopathy. But exercise echocardiography is a sort of inexpensive, feasible test to, we can bring into clinical practice to differentiate athlete's heart from, dil uh, from dilated cardiomyopathy. And the data that we have shown suggests that if we use this figure of 10% as a definition for contractile reserve, then this is something uh, we can, this is a very useful test.